faces. Mm. Well, there was a, <laughs> you can see in those faces the horror of the, what they're about to face. I'm Charles Kuralt, and with me, Walter Cronkite. As you might uh, gather from the photographs in this gallery, the subject of our meeting here is World War II. We'll be talking about that war, hearing some of Walter Cronkite's reminiscences, and seeing some dramatic scenes of the combat that engulfed the globe. It's a long time since then, Charles, over four decades, I guess, uh, since the Nazis launched the war and, of course, swept across Europe. And then that fateful day of infamy, December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. There are those of us who remember the events of that war from photographs like these, pictures we saw in our newspapers and magazines, and of course in those pre-television days in the newsreels at the movie theaters. And there are those like Walter Cronkite who remember that war because they were there in it. In North Africa, as he was on the beach at Normandy, in the bombers over Germany, at the Battle of the Bulge and other important battles. As a war correspondent, Walter Cronkite covered much of the action from Africa right through Europe. Walter, uh, to begin with, you were a young man. Couldn't you find anything better to do in that period than be a war correspondent? It sounds like dangerous work to me. Well, as a matter of fact, you really couldn't have found anything better to do uh, if you're going to be a journalist. Uh, nearly all of us wanted to get overseas before the war as foreign correspondents. That was always the big goal, as you know, most of us newspaper business. And you wore military uniforms, submitted to, to military discipline, did you? Well, submitting to military discipline, I, I doubt very seriously that any of the military thought we submitted to discipline. We may have thought we did by some, uh, you know, we were, yeah. we were constantly fighting against it. It was an onerous idea that we should be. There wasn't any discipline, no, for the, for the correspondent. We wore uh, uniforms uh, uh, with, without uh, rank or insignia, or anything but a war correspondent badge. As a matter of fact, in the very first days of the war, when uh, right after Pearl Harbor and Americans were going into American uniforms as correspondents, I think I was maybe the first to go down to Brooks and say, uh, I, I need something. Well, I need a war correspondent uniform. What do you have? <laughs> they said, we don't know. What are you supposed to have? I didn't know. The Army didn't know. And it was decided, well, uh, we were going to have simulated rank, so-called. They called it uh, our, our assimilated rank or simulated rank. Um, they called it assimilated rank, and what they meant to call it simulated rank, so it went through the war as being assimilated rank, which meant nothing as far <laughs> as I know. But uh, that's one of those bureaucratic things that happened. But uh, equally confusing, where well, they didn't know what uniform to put us in. And I called from Brooks, and I said, listen, they don't know what a war correspondent uniform is. Don't you guys know? And I was going with the Navy uh, uh, to cover the first uh, convoys after Pearl Harbor. And uh, they said, uh, gosh, we don't know. Uh, well, we'll call the War Department, see if they've got any war correspondent uniforms. And they made it up, I think, while I stood at Brooks. They said, well, why don't you get just an officer's uniform? You're an assimilated uh, captain or major or something. Uh, don't get any rank insignia and, and, and obviously no uh, branch of service. And I said, well, you, you got to put something on, don't we, to say we're war crimes. Well, we'll figure that one out after you get the uniform. They came back and said, we've decided on a green brassard that you'll wear around the thing with, with uh, 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 C, a C on it, a big C. So I got this and the green brassard and the C, and I went off a couple of days later on one of the biggest convoys we'd ever sent out of this port of New York uh, on the battleship uh, Arkansas, I guess I was. And when I got aboard the thing down in, in the, at the battery, at night, the captain of the boat, of the ship, assigned me to the chaplain and told the chaplain, take care of this guy. He didn't know what to do with a war correspondent. Nobody had any idea what, what, what is a war correspondent. So he assigned the chaplain as my escort officer, so to speak. Well, I was around with the chaplain for about three days. He's a great guy, a wonderful fellow. Uh, but every time I went in the wardroom, I noticed that the conversation kind of died. It didn't seem as spirited as it had been when I walked in. Uh, I was somehow uh, something of a pall on the a, on a general conviviality of the gathering of the officers there. And about the third day that one of them finally said to me, he said, uh, by the way, chaplain, what denomination are you? And I said, 
I'm not a chaplain. I think I probably used some profanity in saying I wasn't a chaplain, although I admire them, the group greatly. But, uh, but uh, I said I wasn't one. And he said, well, you're not? Uh, well, you're with chaplain so-and-so. And I said, well, yeah, but I'm a war correspondent. He said, oh, that's what that C is. We thought it said it stood for chaplain. <laughs> and I got over the other side, and I got into a bar in Greenwich, and a, a, a British casual officer's bar. And I stood there at the bar having a drink. And there were two officers, Scottish officers, at the other end of the bar, and they kept looking at me, not with friendliness. And they, one of them finally came down to the other end of the bar, and he said, listen, in your army, is it customary for a cashiered officer to drink at the officer's bar? <laughs> he thought, he thought the cashier stood for cashiered. <laughs> <laughs> well, they well, changed that and gave us a little insignia that said war correspondence. I thought it was excessive to say that you invented uh, being a war correspondent. Apparently, you really did. <laughs> first assignment was the North Atlantic convoys. Uh, U-boats must have been on your mind making that crossing. Well, more than on my mind. They were in my vision, uh, in a sense. I didn't actually see any U-boats, but we had a couple of, uh, of uh, episodes uh, where they were around, and our destroyer escort was out pumping depth charges at them, all that sort of thing. Uh, on that uh, particular convoy, we didn't lose any vessels. That was a very high-speed uh, uh, convoy all of transport ships and uh, and uh, and we got through with no trouble the next convoy i was out on was a little different matter with uh, where oil tankers were getting sunk around us and that sort of thing pretty brutal weren't you afraid oh sure terrified the whole time but uh, there, there's no uh, there wasn't any much courage in what i did tell you the truth because i did everything once uh, before I knew how bad it was going to be, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, you, you, you didn't, if you didn't have to go back the second time, uh, it wasn't all that terrible, really. Uh, it was always worse even than you can imagine, but on the other hand, as I say, if you didn't have to live that way day after day, I don't, I never understood how, how our combat soldiers could slug it out day after day, week after week, month after month, how the flyers could go out every day knowing that this might be the last one uh gosh that's courage you were in that first group of correspondents uh in the air raids on germany the first time correspondents were permitted to go you went uh b-17s don't uh, fly very fast it seems to me that that must have taken a little bit of courage well, it was a terrific assignment. It was one that, uh, that uh, I think most of the correspondents in England would have liked to have had at that time. I was lucky to be covering the air war because that was the big story out of, out of uh, London, of course. It wasn't any, any ground action. It was the only story out of Europe, the only story uh, you know, the, to be covered there. Where were you? Uh, I was up in the nose in the bombardiers uh, compartment. Uh, they put us through what they called combat crew replacement center ccrc 11 we were all graduates of uh, that was our college at bovington green in england and that was an intensified course in which they were taking infantrymen they were losing so many airmen that they couldn't supply them from the states fast enough so they're taking infantrymen who were not busy in england at the time and turning them into airmen uh, by sending them through this combat crew replacement center and uh, you taught us high altitude first aid, high altitude being 17,500 feet, which is barely takeoff altitude for the jets of today. Uh, the, uh, 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 and, uh, oh, uh, aircraft identification. And, and they taught us gunnery, uh, although it was absolutely against the Geneva Convention, of course, to man a, a gun as a correspondent. But the feeling was that if uh, a bomber lost so many of its gunners that it was undefended in one quarter or another, uh, that, gosh, if you're up there, uh, survival is uh, the, the question. Yeah. Uh, maybe you ought to be able to take, take a gun and fire it and help with it. Uh, I was in the bombardier's bay, uh, uh, bubble, of the, uh, of the fortress, and uh, there were three guns up there, one for the bombardier facing forward, one for the navigator, and the navigator jump from one gun to the other, from the port to the starboard side, depending on where the enemy was coming from. Uh, if a attacking guy, German uh, fighter planes. Yeah, yeah, attacking planes coming in. 
So obviously, if you're up there and uh, we're in a tough fight, I took the gun on the starboard side and the navigator the one on the other side, so the three of us were pounding away at the incoming enemy. <laughs> when oh I fired so many, so many 50 caliber bullets that I was up to hips and, uh, and spent shells before we got through that battle, over two hours. From um, the nose of a B-17, I suppose you have a wonderful view of the anti-aircraft fire. I suppose, if you want to look at it, I guess that's the place to look at it from. I want to tell you on that trip, Charles, as the flyboy said, the flak was so thick you could get out and walk on it. <laughs> it was uh, pretty heavy. I'll tell you one of the interesting things about it was that the, 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 we had three B-17 groups which kept their formations very well. Uh, the liberators, one group of liberators, far more dangerous for the liberators because they didn't have the same kind of... of group formation flying capability that the B-17 had, which involved uh, an inflating, infl inflating field of fire from all these guns. The Liberators went in almost alone. They went in a group, but uh, they were flying kind of all over the sky. And they went in at a little different altitude than we did. Well, it turned out they went across us, about a thousand feet above us, and their bombardiers aren't looking, of course, at other aircraft. They're only looking through the, that, that scope. When they saw the crosshairs, they pressed the buttons or whatever. And, and that happened that they were right above us when they dropped their bombs. Well, these bombs kept, came floating down through the B-17 fleet. Luckily, none were hit. But at that altitude, with the bombs just having been released and the relative speed, the bombs floated past the nose of the of our B-17, oh, right. so you could actually read off the side, to hell with Hitler, Mabel, Brooklyn, you know, the things that have been scrawled on there in the World War II style of graffiti. It was really rather an extraordinary sight to see these big bombs with their, with their veins turning, going right past you in the window. <laughs> I think um, having been on a trip like that and returned, I would be so... Um Excited, I might not be able to sit down to the typewriter and write the story. Uh, do you remember what you wrote? A, a, a problem. Uh, it is a problem. Uh, uh, yes, I remember very well what I wrote because there's a wonderful correspondent named Homer Bigger who won two Pulitzer Prizes, very rare, for his uh, repertorial work. Uh, he was with the uh, New York Times, and he and I flew from the same base, 303rd Base at Molesworth, and we were riding in the jeep they'd furnish us or command car back to the, the Ministry of Information to write our stories. And uh, uh, as we got in the car, Homer, who had a little stutter, said, uh, said uh, oh, what's your lead? And I said, I, I've just been thinking of it. I think it's going to be, I've just returned from an assignment to hell, a hell of bursting flak and screaming fighter planes and falling bombs and bursting flak a hell at 17,000 feet above Wilhelmshaven. And Homer, who had a, a much finer touch than I, <laughs> and saw a bromide and a cliche when he, when, he, when he was presented to him, looked at me for a long time and said, you, 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 you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that kind of lead after that kind of an assignment, though. Yeah. Then there was Normandy. Um, you were there too. Well, I was at uh, Normandy, not on, uh, not on the beaches of Normandy on D-Day, but over the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. Uh, I still was assigned to the Air Forces and uh, was rather disappointed that I wasn't moved over to a, uh, a landing assignment for the first day, kind of. <laughs> disappointed. In theory, I was disappointed. I think in my heart, I was pretty happy that I wasn't going to be on the beaches with that first landing wave. But, uh, and I, I was supposed to be in the office writing the lead. That was my assignment uh, for D-Day. We didn't know what it was going to be, of course, and none of us were, were let in on that secret. And I was uh, pretty sure it was going to be within the next three or four days, the way things seemed to be shaping up. Uh, and I was fast in my bed in my apartment in London uh, around one o'clock one morning, or midnight or so, when uh, a guy named Hal Leishon, who was a major of the U.S. Air Force Public Relations, came into the, my room, or knocked on the door, I answered, of course, he came in and he said, uh, listen, uh, 
I want to just say one thing to you. It's all I can tell you. I've got one of the best assignments that this war is likely to produce. It's highly dangerous. You can't let your office know that you've got to come with me right now. And you come, and I can promise you that you'll be back and in your office by noon. I said, well, I figured that had something to do with D-Day. And I said, of course, let's go. And I threw my clothes on. We went out to that same group that I'd flown with uh, going to Germany, the 303rd at Molesworth. We got out there about uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. Already the planes were being revved up. We got there barely in time. It turned out that at the very last minute that night, the com high command had decided that there was a heavier concentration of Germans in the Bayou area, Bayou Khan area, than, than they had an anticipated. They needed a lot of heavy bomb power very quickly. They had not trained the B-17s to go in at low altitude at all. It had never been suggested that they'd ever be trained to go in at that altitude. But <clears throat> here was an emergency and had to be done. So this was the group nominated. What it meant was we were going in at the lowest altitude of, of anybody where they could carry correspondence. And we were going in at about 150 feet, as I remember, and going over the, over the this concentration and turning right around and coming right back to base to pick up another load. But I would be the first person to see the landing from 150 feet and how it was going and back and be able to report the story. It was a dream assignment. So we went. Unfortunately, when we got there, that terrible weather of D-Day had closed in. And of course, we couldn't bomb uh, when our troops were already beginning to come ashore without seeing the target. And you just couldn't see it clearly enough. There was fog bound, terrible. Well, here we were in fog with the, all the bomb, the bomb bay doors open, all the bombs loaded and armed and ready to explode upon impact. And and in a formation of planes just a few feet away from each other in the fog. <laughs> and we climbed out of there very gently, as you can imagine. Uh, I'd expected, we expected the whole formation to go up, because once two of them had gone, we were so close together, it would have just spread through the fleet. And uh, instead, we climbed out and, uh, and got back to London, still landing with a lot of the bombs still armed, and in a fog in London, uh, or in England, uh, some of the some of the bombardiers uh, and uh, had gotten down and their crews had gotten down in the bomb bay and rearm uh, you know re put the safeties back on them re defused them uh, so a lot of them were safe but i think all of them weren't it was a it was a hairy mission and a disappointing one because in the meanwhile of course d-day had started the announcement had come out they'd called the apartment to get me down to the office and i was gone and the suspicion was, I, of course, I was out to no good in London town, and, uh, and my reputation was rather uh, seriously tarnished there for a few hours. Well, now we come to uh, September 44, wasn't it? Uh, the British and American paratroopers right. uh, going in in gliders in the lower Rhine at the place that uh, we still remember, Arnhem. Operation uh, Market Garden, it was going on. Was it Market Garden? Uh, Market Garden. Um, I think uh, I might have turned that assignment down, the idea of, <laughs> of, of landing no, you in, have, in, in a glider. Uh, it well, must have been terribly dangerous. I tell you, I came a little close. That may have been the closest I came to actually, actually flatly refusing an assignment. I was there again. I was nominated for the air born forces after Normandy, and when they formed the first Allied Airborne Army, uh, and uh, uh, took a little training, a paratroop training, no drops, but a lot of theoretical training and, and tower dropping. But I got up there that night uh, for that mission and uh, was ready to go in as a paratrooper, and they said, you're assigned to a glider. Well, I had seen what had happened to the gliders in Normandy, and that was a, a, a horror. Uh, they crashed into anti-glider barriers, and uh, there had been a lot of casualties. And uh, I really thought to myself, I don't think I want to go to war in a glider. Uh, I went ahead and did, and I want to report that that is a poor way to go to war, Charles. If you get an opportunity to go to war, don't take a glider. Take, uh, 
take something else. Can you describe the last minute or so after you're cut away from the tow plane? What happens? Well, the first disappointment was that, that, that the plane didn't fly very well. <laughs> I suppose it did, but the technique was not, was, it, it didn't glide in like a beautiful soar plane. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the first disappointment was it wasn't quiet. I thought we're going to war by glider, at least it'd be quiet. Well, it wasn't quiet. It, the, the, our Waco CG4s, as they were called, were built around aluminum frame with canvas covers, like a drum. And uh, the canvas beat against the aluminum frame. Uh, it was so noisy you couldn't talk in the glider. It was awful noise, deafening. Uh, uh, so that was one disappointment. Then when they dropped the tow cable, the, the airplane, instead of gliding, just the nose dropped, boom, it just fell like a rock. And I thought, well, that's it. You know, I should have known better. Gliders don't fly. They, they crash, and that's what's happening. As it turned out, we had a superb pilot. That's exactly what he should have been doing. That's the technique, to get out of the flak and, and the uh, get as much speed as possible so that you're not a target, or as small a target you can be. So you dive at, up to the point where you think you're going to lose your wings. You sense your G-force and pull back, and it's a, you know, flatten out, and you just think those fragile wings are going to go. Sometimes and then he, they did. And sometimes they did. And then make a very fast 180-degree turn and, and get on the ground as quickly as possible. So the dive is right down to the ground and up, make the turn into the, onto the surface. And then the technique uh, is, which I didn't know, they didn't explain to me either, the technique at that point is to uh, feel the earth under you, this for the pilot, and if it's soft, as it hoped it'll be, uh, get that nose dug into the ground as quickly as possible. In other words, a controlled crash landing, also to stop the aircraft so that it doesn't fly, it uh, doesn't roll too long with enemy fire against it. That must be pretty hard on the troops who are in the glider. Uh, it was. It certainly comes as an awful shock if you haven't been told about it. I can tell you that. Uh, we went way up a tail up. A, it takes tremendous courage. Those glider pilots were absolutely sensational. But can you imagine? They were sitting in a little plastic bubble, right like this. Here's the bubble, and the ground's right under you. And to take it, and with your own face being foremost, just put that thing into the dirt. And a lot of them were were killed that way. Uh, uh, but the plane is a controlled crash, and the dirt comes flying into the thing. It breaks up quite a bit. You fall out onto the ground and grab your musette bag and your helmet and, uh, and, and hope that you make it to the rendezvous ditch or, where, or the copse of woods or wherever you're going to rendezvous. And as a matter of fact, when we, when we climbed out of ours, I was with a little headquarters group of 14 guys. Actually, I think it was 13, which may have been the problem. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, uh, we fell out of this broken up glider, and the uh, helmets had come off, although it's one of the great dangers of glider landings, this crash. If helmets flying through the air, they're pretty heavy yeah. missile, you know. So, uh, uh, but we had them hooked, but they still came off, like shoes in an automobile accident, yeah. you know, that terrible thing. Well, so... Uh, uh, our helmets come off. I grabbed a helmet out of the dirt and plunked it on my head. My musette bag, I had two, one with a, few, with a shirt in it, a clean shirt, and one with my typewriter and paper. And I started crawling, because I didn't see anybody leading the way, I started crawling across the field toward where I thought the rendezvous point was. And other gliders are crashing around us. One crashed right over our head, and I, uh, I'm hitting another glider, and a jeep spilled out of it and <laughs> dropped about five feet from us with an awful thud and bodies. And, Anyway, we're starting across this thing, and I'm, you know, the usual thing you've seen in the movies, crouching and ducking and crouching and falling. I did this about three times. A guy tugged at my pants leg, and I realized that, that I had some fellows behind me here. And this is a sergeant. The sergeant said, hey, lieutenant, are you sure we're going in the right direction? I said, I'm not a lieutenant. I'm a war correspondent. And he let out a string of profanity and said, well, in that case, take off that lieutenant's helmet. <laughs> I had a great white stripe down the back of my helmet, that met, met lieutenant or, or officer, and they were all following this officer. I didn't know where I was going. It's a wonder we uh, won the war with such war correspondent uh, tactics as that. Well, a few years after the war ended, of course, you joined CBS News, and you've spent a good bit of time since preparing reports on the war often, including uh, some pretty dramatic footage from both Axis and uh, Allied sources. 
Those are the stories that are being compiled in this special World War II video collection. One of those uh, reports you did for CBS News uh, deals with uh, an event that uh, helped close the war in Europe. Uh, you were with uh, General Patton's Third Army at the time when the 101st Airborne was surrounded at uh, a place history remembers very well, a place called uh, Bastogne. Would you uh, set the scene for us now as we uh, look back on the Battle of the Bulge? Well, the year was 1944, the winter. The place, the Belgian city of Bastogne, beleaguered, besieged, refusing to surrender. Here, American troops write an unforgettable chapter in military history. And here, too, the American General Anthony McAuliffe of the 101st Airborne Division replies to a German surrender demand with just one word, nuts. The word and deed are both recorded in the annals of this awesome chapter of World War II, the Battle of the Bulge. This is the Ardennes Front, 25 miles east of Bastogne. On December 15, 1944, six American divisions are thinly stretched along the rugged 85-mile sector. The GIs call this the Ghost Front, a cold but safe, peaceful place to spend Christmas. Half of the men, exhausted in battle, have been sent here to recuperate. The other half are brand new, sent here to be lightly tested in combat. They patrol a quiet front. Since D-Day, the once great Nazi war machine has been completely routed, chased back here to the German border. GIs and generals alike are confident Hitler's empire will soon collapse. Total victory seems near. Twice in the past, Germany has invaded West Europe down this road in 1914 and 1940. Now Hitler plans a third invasion, a dying Germany's last desperate gamble. Three powerful armies, secretly assembled, are poised to attack the peaceful Ardennes on December 16th. Hitler plans to reach the Meuse River in two days, capture Antwerp in a week. If successful, the greatest turnabout in military history. Says Hitler, we gamble everything now, we cannot fail. exultantly sweep forward. Hundreds of Nazi spearheads pierce the completely surprised American lines. to stage a robots against the Americans, an orgy of cruelty. Near Malmedy, his order results in massacre. 84 captured GIs are shot down by SS men as they stand helplessly in this field. These are Americans, their legs strapped tightly to keep them from escaping. All along the Ardennes front, GIs fall back from the relentless German attack. As Hitler boasted, the surprise is complete, devastating. Now exposure of a new Nazi terror, American uniforms found in a Nazi tank. 
This is a German caught masquerading as a GI. His mission has been to breed confusion and panic behind American lines. He and others like him are treated as spies. alarm is spread. Trust no one in American uniform. The old passwords are ditched. Sentries now ask, who is Mickey Mouse's girlfriend? Many of the suspect answers, okay, he's GI. Even ambulances can hide the masquerading Germans. But not this one. These are Americans. The German 5th Panzer Army has made a complete breakthrough. Its commander, General von Manteuffel, now sees only one important barrier between his tanks and victory, Bastogne. Manteuffel gives the job of taking Bastogne to General Heinrich von Lutwitz. By midnight of December 18th, the three divisions of Lutwitz are only eight miles from Bastogne. Take it at all costs, he orders. Otherwise, it will remain an abscess on our line of communication. Bastogne, possible abscess, key to the Ardennes. A dozen important highways and railroads extend from it like spokes in a wheel. Here the battle will be decided. A race to Bastogne begins. A combat command of the American 10th Armored Division forges slightly ahead of the Germans. With luck, this one-third of a division will reach the town several hours before the Nazis. Meanwhile, 120 miles west in France, an airborne division, the crack 101st, is rushed by truck to Bastogne. The 10th armored men win the race, meet the Germans to Bastogne. General Troy Middleton, commander of the U.S. 8th Corps, orders them to fan out in front of the town. Mission to delay the Nazis until the 101st arrives from France. General McAuliffe, deputy commander of the 101st, reaches Bastogne ahead of his men. Nazi tanks cut all roads above Bastogne. As terrified Belgians try to escape to the west, the Germans are circling behind Bastogne, cutting off their retreat. The 101st Airborne men finally reach Bastogne, just in time, for the tiny defending task forces of the 10th Armored Division are being overwhelmed by the invaders. Bastogne is cut off on three sides, east, north, and west. Further reinforcements can now come only from the south. Nazi tanks surge toward the last open road to Bastogne. Only one more mile to go. The German pincers begin to clamp around the town. GIs get the word. Panzers. Bastogne is surrounded. Fire in all directions. On December 21st, the Germans press in on surrounded Bastogne. December 22nd, the situation is desperate. The defenders fall back yard by yard. In grim just those who survive call themselves the battered bastards of Bastogne. Many do not survive. Suddenly at 11.30 a.m., German fire ceases. Nazi General von Lutwitz sends an ultimatum to Bastogne. 
immediate surrender or total annihilation. Several hours pass. Finally, General McAuliffe, now commanding all troops in Bastogne, gives his answer. Nuts. town and its gallant garrison will be destroyed unless help arrives. Far to the south, General George Patton Jr. has, three days before, received orders from Eisenhower to relieve Bastogne fast. He tells Eisenhower, I'll be ready to attack in 48 hours. He must first turn his entire Third Army 90 degrees to the north and race 100 miles over icy roads. It seems impossible. army, tanks and foot soldiers, does the impossible. In two days, they're ready to attack. But the Germans who now stand between them and Bastogne are also ready. from Bastogne, the Third Army advance is slowed down by the coldest winter in 20 years. Foot by foot, the GIs advance slowly, painfully, toward Bastogne, against cold, ice, snow, and determined Germans. Around at Bastogne, it is even colder. Casualties mount and supplies diminish dangerously. There's only one way to supply Bastogne, from the air. The planes are long overdue. Where are they? The planes are grounded. Loaded with supplies, they wait for clear weather. Pilots volunteer to take off in spite of fog, sleet, and snow. for Bastogne today. By the morning of December 23rd, the surrounded men of Bastogne think they've been forgotten. Time is running out for them. So is food and ammunition.
and medicine. The weather is cleared, where's the Air Force? Everyone asks the same question. Out of machine gun ammo here, where's the Air Force? No grenades here. In every foxhole around Bastogne, the men wait, wonder and ask, where's the Air Force? Then, later that morning, Den skies are clear for the first time since Hitler's attack. C-47 transports drop hundreds of gaily colored parachutes. Here at last are mortar shells, hand grenades, machine gun ammunition, gasoline canisters, radio batteries, winter clothing, plasma, bandages, food. A Christmas present from the Air Force. Replenished with ammunition and food, the G.I.s return to their positions around Bastogne. Alarming reports of full-scale Nazi attacks come from all sides of the perimeter. It is Christmas Eve. It is quiet. Too quiet. Nazi terror weapon is used, giant searchlights, artificial moonlight, to probe the Bastogne defenses. GI box holes and gun emplacements are exposed. the terrific German barrage has knocked out the American front-line positions west of Bastogne. Now Nazi infantry and tanks begin to break into the suburbs of the town. Nazis are finally stopped only two miles from the center of Bastogne, but the next attack may crash through. The Third Army is coming to the rescue. In a sudden, brilliant flanking thrust, Patton finds a hole in the German wall. He is now only 10 miles from Bastogne and moving up fast. Surprised Germans frantically try to seal up the hole. armor plunges forward. It is a complete breakthrough. Many Germans surrender. Patton's infantrymen advance through the breach made by the armor. The third army, men and tanks, closes in on Bastogne. To 
December 26, 1944. Patton's tanks enter Bastogne. There is no time for celebration. This is only the spearhead of the Third Army attack. At last, GI infantrymen approach the edge of Bastogne. There's the dirty, deadly job of mopping up behind the tanks. The Doe's reach the center of town. Now the rescue corridor is safely shored up. The siege of Bastogne is over. Patton enters Bastogne and orders his men to turn east and drive toward Germany. There will be a month's hard fighting before the greatest pitched battle on the Western Front, the Battle of the Bulge, is finally won. In another part of the town, General Maxwell Taylor, commander of the 101st, congratulates his deputy, Anthony McAuliffe, the man who directed the stubborn defense of Bastogne. Within four months, this victory will lead to total victory in Europe. Bastogne was just one episode in the great campaign we now remember as the Battle of the Bulge. Over half a million GIs fought in that enormous and costly campaign. 19,000 of them died. And there, too, in the frozen Ardennes, died Hitler's last great dream of World War II. Now here's word about some of the other stories in our series, the CBS Video Library of World War II. World War II. The words evoke a time of terror, atrocity, heroism, and war on a monumental scale. This special video series with Walter Cronkite as host will capture some of the memorable people and events that shape this greatest and most destructive military conflict in history. In one episode, we'll meet General Jimmy Doolittle and witness the nerve-wracking takeoff of some B-25s bound for Tokyo on a daring mission in 1942, the Doolittle Raid. The pilots were hurriedly given their final briefing, climbed into their planes, warmed up, and the signal to go off the flight deck was given. Colonel Doolittle, in the lead, was certain he could get off. I watched him roll down the deck, pull up his plane sharply, and I was afraid it would crash. He put his nose over, however, and pulled away in the direction of Japan. A different kind of heroism is chronicled in another thrilling chapter, as Allied ships bearing supplies to the Soviet Union are trapped by German air and sea power and find themselves on a suicide run to Murmansk. be on the beaches as the Allies launch their first major counterattack of the war. Their target, North Africa. Nothing can be done to avoid conflict. At some points, the French are resisting fiercely and the Allies must retaliate. Besides focusing on the main events of World War II, this unique video series will spotlight the key personalities in that struggle. In one episode, the charismatic, unpredictable leader of Italy will be profiled, Benito Mussolini. In 1938, Rome gives Hitler a spectacular welcome. The new goose step is the icing on the cake. Mussolini agrees to German military assistance and to the disgust of racially tolerant Italy, introduces anti-Semitism. Behind the scenes, all is not so tranquil. Mussolini claims the little king is upstaging him, and Hitler finds his welcome lacking in warmth. Publicly, all is unity. On parting, Mussolini says, henceforth, no force can separate us. 
a portrait of the general whose lightning strikes across North Africa earned him the name The Desert Fox, will be drawn in another gripping chapter, Rommel. The British armor is outgunned and outmaneuvered. More than half their tanks are destroyed and the rest limp back to Egypt. The initiative gained, Rommel streaks for Tobruk, his old nemesis. forces had a general as colorful and controversial as Rommel, who led an army so effective it was called lucky. Walter Cronkite, who traveled with that army, chronicles the exploits of Patton and the Third Army. On November 8, 1942, George S. Patton leads 32,000 untried troops into North Africa, launching his first campaign of World War II. At 57, he has been a hell for leather cavalrymen, organizer of the first American tank forces in World War I, student of history, deeply religious, an amateur poet, but is little known to the American public. He will soon find fame as the great gambler among modern generals, the one who loves to court the extraordinary risk. All my life, I have wanted to lead a lot of men in a desperate battle, he has written. I will leave the beaches either a conqueror or a corpse. By spring 1943, most of North Africa is overrun. No great planner, Patton has little patience with soldiers who go at war methodically. Find the enemy, hit him fast to get him off balance, then smite him down. That's his way. Grip your weapon, don't be gripped by supply. It isn't book generalship, it's almost medieval, but it's the Patton way, and it works. We land on the bloody beaches of Normandy, where the bravery and endurance of British and American fighting men became legend. It was a day in June 1944 called D-Day. German defenses have survived the heaviest bombardment in history. On one beach, 80% of German guns are firing. It is an infantryman's nightmare. Germans on the cliffs level plunging fire at the men coming out of the landing boats. Men try to hide by ducking underwater. Many are hit and killed or are wounded and drowned. Utah alone is relatively quiet. In the first hour, the assault achieves less on Omaha than had been expected of it in the first five minutes. Up and down the line from Omaha to Sword, 2,500 of our men die in a few hours of hell. Incredible footage shot in the Soviet Union gives a glimpse of the terrible suffering endured by three million Russians during the 880-day siege of Leningrad. The city in November is an island in a sea of Germans. Leningraders now call the rest of Russia the mainland. Nearby Lake Ladoga is partly frozen over, preventing delivery of food and fuel. The last rail line has long been cut. German warplanes shoot down small attempts at an airlift. A 20th century metropolis begins its long, slow dance of death. Its arteries drained, its multitude of little machines stopped. fury of the Japanese kamikaze pilot is in evidence in an episode featuring actual footage of kamikaze attacks on the American fleet at Okinawa. Each 
kamikaze has one goal, to get an American ship. Most of them miss or are shot down, but the fanaticism of mass suicide pays off and many ships are struck. One of the most joyous and moving episodes of the entire series captures the emotional first moments of freedom after the liberation of Paris. Allons enfants de la patrie, le jour de gloire est arrivé. Contre nous de la tyrannie, les poudres sanglantes élevées, les poudres sanglantes. Scenes, all of these stories, and more will be included in this unique video compilation produced by CBS News, narrated by Walter Cronkite, and spanning the entire awesome period of history known as World War II.